Ten years ago, I came to Lower Deer Creek, and it would have been in the summer. Uh, I came with a boot on because I had a crack in my heel, and I've always heard this. When you, like, hit mile markers, something always happens, like, significant. And I think it's, there's no real truth, truth to it other than when it actually happens. And I came here on a candidating weekend, and I had a, I have a heel spur and I had a crack in it and the doctor basically said you're gonna have to have surgery at this point it's just gonna have inflammation and uh, they spent time trying to heal it didn't heal and I came here and Shirley Yoder told me she was praying for me and praying that I would find healing in that and uh, honestly uh, so here I am ten years later I've never had surgery on it I will occasionally have a little bit of pain in my heel but the, the doctor said you can't, it's not something that's going to heal on its own. There's not enough blood flow. You're just going to have to have surgery at some point. And I believe in the power of prayer, and I believe that God heard the request that Shirley and maybe others were praying for this guy that came with a boot that in everything in the world, just say, well, you go to the doctor, you do these, go through these steps, and you'll be healed. If not, you have surgery and, you're, and you just take care of it, right? I'm just trying to get it. Like, this is how my mind thinks all the time with medical things, with traveling, with a lot of things that we lift up in prayer. It's like, well, it's going to happen regardless because it's just how the world works. And until you see stuff that you have to claim that God had a part of it, uh, you don't believe in the power of prayer. I think at times we just reduce prayer to human occurrences by luck, by human understanding. We don't just claim the power that God has. So I say that like prayer is so important. It's so important individually. It's so important in the corporate body of the church. I would say, unfortunately, uh, the prayers in the church too often feel like a prayer just before a meal. It's just something you do. Or I can say, and it's funny because I was reading a book and it said almost these same words, like we just use it for transition. You know, if we just have everybody close their eyes and we say a prayer at this point, well, the worship team can get up to their spot or the worship team can sit down and we'll make it real short, but we can make the transitions nice and smooth right? In some sense, we do that whether we like it or not. Do you see the danger in too little prayer? Where prayer is present, it's saying something, it's speaking, it's shouting, it's teaching the church that we really need the Lord. Where prayer is absent, it reinforces that we're just okay without him. It teaches the church that God's only needed in special situations under certain circumstances. It teaches the church when prayer is absent that it's only, prayer is only needed when we really need it, when there's some dire circumstance. Prayer, it needs to be central in the church. And so we look at Matthew 6, and I love it because Jesus gives us a perfect example. You can turn there if you want. He, he summarizes things really well. And he gives us this model to look at. And it's found here, Matthew 6, 9 through 13. And before I go there, I want to just go to those verses before because the verses before talk about how when we pray, not to be like the hypocrites. This is Matthew 6, verses 5 through 8. It says, When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received the reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. 
and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. See, there's this push to pray privately. And we need to have a good private prayer life. See, those people, those religious leaders, they're just going and they're praying just so they can get a little more attention and show how holy they are. It, they make it about themselves. So he says there needs to be good private prayer. And don't have big, long, out, drawn out prayers. Verse 7 says, When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they have heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So then Jesus summarizes it. What our prayer should look like. It says, Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also are forgiving our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And you can look at it in different versions or in, in Luke, and it might have a few different words for debts or sins or trespasses. But what I want to say is it needs to be about him. It needs about be about his will being done, not just our human comfort. Those first verses, it says, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And this is where I think Jesus would say, yes, you need to pray in privately, but it needs to be a corporate thing. It's not my Father in heaven. It's our Father in heaven. And Father in Aramaic would have been Abba. And it's this picture of a Father who is loving, intimate, has authority, has warmth. So when we pray to our Father, we are praying with an intimate God who in His loving character, His loving nature, He is like a good Father to us. Our Father in heaven. And then this is the phrase that just has hit me harder and harder is hallowed be your name. And what I, what I want to say to this, and hopefully this hits home as I was studying and look at this, like what I always make this out to be is just a statement. I make this phrase here, hallowed be your name, it, it's just a truth that I could claim, Right? That's what I always make it out to our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. But what I really think is it's one of the first of the petitions that comes across here. God is holy. He doesn't need to be told in a prayer that he is holy, that he is hallowed. He doesn't need to be told that he is holy, that he is sanctified. So I think this is the first petition and it is us saying in our lives that God in your life, in my life, sorry, God in my life, may you be hallowed. In my life, may I call you holy. In my life, may I call you sanctified, pure. May I look at you like the great God that you are. May I not simplify you down to a God that just cares about our little medical things that are happening on this world. And I need to be careful I say that because there's some huge things that we need to just put before God, but we look at things in our earthly sense. Our Father in heaven, may you be hallowed in my life. May I lift your name on high. It's a petition. It's a request. And there's six requests here. I think it's hallowed be your name, 
your kingdom come. We're praying that God's kingdom will come here on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And those are all about God. It's all about him. And then we start praying for some of these personal things. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. Forgive us our sins. Forgive us our trespasses if we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. There's so much we could go into in all of these petitions. I really want to make sure that we get this part of it. And I think you can see this on the screen. Those last three petitions, and this is what we typically do in our prayer. We pray about these things. We pray about needs that there are. We pray about uh, our, our health. We pray about circumstances in our life. We pray about challenging situations. That's what our sharing time looks like a lot. But really, those three things all just serve the first three. And really, they serve the first one primarily. See, we pray that we can be sustained in our daily life and our, by getting our daily bread, by having our physical needs met. And that's not for our comfort like we like to pray for. Sometimes that's our intent. It's all so that God may be glorified. And we pray about our sins and we pray for forgiveness, not so we can just feel good about ourselves, so that God, through our testimony, he can be glorified. And we pray to stay out of temptation and out of the evil that is pushing in on us, not so that we can be comforted, so that he can be glorified. It's all about him. Our prayers should be all about him and not just our personal comfort. Sometimes that's what we reduce our prayers to. It's not bad to pray about health. It's not bad to pray about whatever circumstance that we see in this earth but it needs to be all about him. And there's so many scriptures that could back up a lot of this stuff. There's so many things that push us towards prayer. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's a gift that God gives us when we cry out to him in prayer. But it's all about him as a good father. It's all about him. It's my hope is that through this, through our prayer life as a church, through our individual prayer life, we won't make it about just our own personal health, wealth, comfort, We'll make it about him. May your name be hallowed. If you want to turn to Acts 4, you want to see a prayer for the church, just listen to these words. The believers praying for boldness. Those days after Jesus was gone, when he was not leading and the, and the disciples, the apostles are now leading the church, they prayed for boldness. And I'm going to go straight to verses 29 of Acts chapter 4. Imagine if this was what our prayers look like all the time. Acts 4, verse 29 says, And now, Lord, look upon their, their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. 
while you, God, while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And says this, when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Imagine if that was our simple prayer. Because a lot of us feel some of the darkness, some of the things in this world that just don't feel right, that are pressing in on the church. What if that was our prayer as a church? Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through your name of your holy servant, Jesus. Man, there's power in that. I really wanted to close up today by just praying for the church. And I'm going to challenge you as we will have sharing time after a closing song. But I'm going to challenge you to let's make this congregational prayer about him. And I'm not saying it's bad to pray against about personal things because we need to bring those requests before God. But it's why we ask for testimonies and I hope today we're just praising God for who he is. And we're just raising that th those things before his throne. So I'm going to pray. And I feel like it's going to be a long, drawn-out prayer. And I don't want it to do it to babble. I just want to do it to bring honor and glory to God. And as we close up and as we sing about God's greatness and as we share together, in my life and our life, may we put the name of Jesus, the name of God, hallowed with the highest honor and set him apart as holy. Let me pray. Lord God, we praise you. We praise you for your goodness, for your holiness, for how you have mercy on us. How every day we experience those mercies and we get to serve you. And God, may our prayer life, may our lives not be just about personal comfort. May they, may they be about bringing you honor and glory and praise that you alone deserve. I pray for the church and for individuals here that are struggling with temptations, struggling with idols. I pray that I, that we would lay those aside and make you first. It's about you, God. It's about you, Jesus. It's about living in your Holy Spirit and being bold with the message that you have for us. There's a world walking in darkness and we need to shed your light. We need to share your light with them. God, may your goodness just shine through, through us. I'm so thankful, God, for who you are for the miracles that you do, for how you have blessed us as a congregation over the years since 1877, how you've brought us through a fire, literally, and you've rebuilt the church and you've expanded the church walls, but how you have filled this place and you've brought a body in that is here to love and serve you. Thank you for us, this congregation. God, I pray that your message will not stay inside these walls, but they will, it will go out boldly 
so that all may know in this community who you are and who your son is. I praise you, God. We thank you. Guide us. In Jesus' name, amen.